uh, these developed countries with large number of displaced and vulnerable people will be able to benefit benefit from our achievements. We allocated the million US dollars to support this partnership. And we are very glad to have Mr. Setipa, uh, the managing director of the technology fund, because he will share his views on how best we can utilize our commitments with the global compact of refugees. We are encouraged by, by the weakness of the private sector to make an impact in this field. If we also consider, consider participating in an inclusive and innovative platform to address the major challenges of our arena, this is the right time and this is the right platform. We invite all of you to join our courses and Turkey will continue to do its shape. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Including Lima, 
uh, is as fast as it Later today, uh, you will hear from two of the companies uh, uh, that have completed the infrastructure in the program, namely GRP from India and TYK and Daniel uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, the accelerator program uh, is an important complementary step to apply a systematic lens to uh, finding innovative solutions uh, to big challenges, including specific challenges faced by refugees and host communities. In 2017 alone, 70 million people worldwide were forcibly displaced. Many of them were either from the LDCs or are being hosted by LDCs. Turkey currently hosts more than 4 million refugees, the largest number uh, in the world since 2014. The country also hosts the UN Technology Land uh, for LDCs, uh, a newly established UN institution uh, that, amongst others, promotes and uh, facilitates the identification of the use of and access of appropriate technology inside the LDCs. Turkey provides an excellent opportunity to explore a new model of an integrated solution to the needs of displaced people as well as the uh, LDCs. We would like to thank you, the Minister, uh, for having given us the opportunity to test this new model and for your continuous support in implementing solutions to achieve the SDG agenda in Turkey and elsewhere. Population of LDCs and displaced communities face daily challenges in implementing the agenda for security and achieving the SDGs, including access to sustainable livelihoods, employment opportunities, poor access to clean water and sanitation, primary health care, education, basic nutrition, and energy. This context demands a radical shift in our perspective as well as our means of addressing these problems. We need structural approaches that are financially self-sustaining. For instance, the scale of employment needs for social economic integration of refugees not only calls for boosting existing job creators, but also to expand the range of opportunities, notably by capitalizing on digital and keyword options. Specific challenges relate, uh, for example, to lower income groups to find access to new trends defining the future of employment, including the digitalization of the employment requiring new skills, global skills services, and ideas to be able to access those opportunities, often not available uh, for the poorest of the poor and the most vulnerable, including refugees and migrants. At the same time, a global trends in digitalization of employment would provide specific opportunities for migrants and refugees through remote and mobile work opportunities, ranging from web design, software development, translation services, and allowing people to benefit from employment opportunities elsewhere. As part of the SDG Impact Accelerator Initiative, UNDP Sustainable Center is currently working on a new study to develop and nurture the impact investment for its ecosystem in Turkey, aiming to position impact investment investing uh, as an innovative financing mechanism for the implementation of the SDGs in the countries as well as in the other developing countries. This holistic approach, role and commitment of the government of Turkey in this initiative is exemplary it to demonstrate that how an emerging donor can devise it and scale up its own contribution to the global development in close collaboration with the private sector. The efforts are outstanding in terms of social entrepreneurship in the sense that the solutions uh, provided are market-driven and have high potential to become financially self-sustainable and driven by the private sector following the technical and financial support provided to the initiative. We look forward to working with all of you in this exciting process and bring innovative solutions and creating impact for our world. Thank you very much.
established by the United German Assembly by a resolution adopted in 2016. Turkey hosts the bank since June 2018. Uh, it is a bank, uh, it's not a money bank actually, it's an intellectual property bank that aims to develop the science, technology, and innovation capacity of the LDCs. Uh, some of the LDCs, as you all know, are the source countries of the displaced people, while others, uh, such as Bangladesh or Uganda, host millions of them. The uh, UN Technology Bank will soon start uh, a new partnership with the SDG Impact Accelerator in selected LDCs. To tell us more about how the bank can contribute to the implementation of the Global Compact on Refugees, with partnership with the Accelerator, I now have the pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Sikhar. Thank you very much for that. Uh,
soon. Uh, this president will take it to the next level by mobilizing other private sector actors to join the platform. It will be very inspiring to know why DMAC is still in the lead in supporting the international efforts to leave no one behind, including the Chinese. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's very nice to participate in a meeting in different parts of the world so that we can share the progress. It's like you know somebody's checking us what we're doing every three months, six months. So I'll share with you what we have done. Excellencies, distinguished partners, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to address on this spotlight session organized within the framework of the World's Social Refugee Forum. And I would like to thank His Excellency Deputy Minister Kiran for his presence and for his support. Despite all the programs, heavy programs, he didn't leave us alone. And also our minister couldn't attend, but who has been a vigorous supporter of the STG Impact Accelerator since the very beginning. Two years in a row in New York at the United Nations Grand General Assembly. And today we are very happy to host a session at the Forum in Geneva. And soon, as we as it's been said, we will listen to two startups whose ideas were chosen to meet the specific challenges of this year's call, the cohort. And before, let me quickly flesh out a few points from my perspective. First, on the refugees, and second, on the SDG Impact Accelerator. I'm a businesswoman representing NIMAC, as Mr. Mustafa said. We are one of the Turkey's business groups, but not only active in Turkey, but also in the region, in the Gulf, in the Middle East, and in East Europe. And why does this issue matter to me, or to my company, or to the private sector? The answer is very clear. It's not only a temporary situation. It has long-term development implications on my country, to the region, and globally. And Turkey has become the largest refugee hosting nation in the world, which is around 4 million refugees, and billions of dollars has been spent, more than 40 million dollars by November 2019 and around which 45% of the Syrians in Turkey are under the age of 18, 29% of them are school age, and 46% of the refugees in Turkey are women. And more than 400,000 babies have been born in Turkey, and these are the very recent figures. And their education, their employment, and their social integration are issues that matter to both refugees, but also to most communities. And I strongly believe that the private sector must be a part of this equation. Because private sector's involvement, especially in economic development and crisis response, is a key component to the, sol to the solution. And we should not forget that. This is what we have been saying since the beginning. Refugees bring with them a wealth of untapped human capital to the host country. And this is our vision, and this is my company's vision, around our involvement in this issue. Ladies and gentlemen, as Mr. Mustafa said, we have been a part of the SDG Impact Accelerator since day one. When I heard this project, I was like, yes, we are in. And it was like in the hotel, we'll be drinking coffee. You know, it's always like that. Big project starts with either drinking coffee or having lunch. <laughs> as DMAC, we are the first private sector player joining the team and embracing the idea. And since, that, since then, together with the project partners and the accelerator team, we are working to turn this forward-looking idea into reality because this is generally missing. We always talk about uh, projects, but when you deliver, it's actually it means it's becoming a reality, and this is what we are trying to achieve day by day. And this whole process helped me draw two simple conclusions from the business perspective. Number one, the critical development and refugee agenda cannot be realized without meaningful engagement. I mean, this is also important. We are looking after for a meaningful engagement of the private sector. And business as usual, that we also use in business a lot, will not simply achieve the <coughs> challenges of the refugees today. Strong engagement of the private sector can open brand new horizons for solutions that are innovative, resilience-based, and forward-looking. Number two, finding solution for these challenges beyond the reach of one entity only. This agenda requires collaboration across 
many companies, many private sector companies, many sectors, many supply chains and economic systems, as well as innovative partnerships with governments and civil society. And distinguished guests, then the question is, how do we scale up initiatives like the SDG Pack Accelerator and bring in more actors into the world, especially from the private sector, where our responsibility starts? The answer is public-private partnerships, which is the theme of today's session. As a businesswoman leading a company mainly operating on construction, infrastructure, and energy, we have done many PVPs in different sectors, in airports, in highway, in energy projects. And Turkey and today's Turkish private sector, we had 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 extensive experience in all, in all types of PVPs. And as we are, we are partnering at the SDG Impact Accelerator, we are contributing to the project through the business knowledge and experience we have gathered on the PPPs, not only in Turkey, also in Africa, and also in Eastern Europe, but by this time, for a development for a social cause. As the pilot phase is over, we have learned a lot from the past. To see where we have succeeded so that we can duplicate the success is important, and to understand where we have fallen short and correct those shortcomings is also important. This is exactly like a business project for us. So the next chapter is the next chapter of development, the next chapter of innovation, innovative partnership, and of doing business. So I believe this next chapter must focus not simply on the dollars we spend, but on the results we will achieve. And of course, this prevents new approaches new global, local, and national partnerships, ownership, leadership, <coughs> but most importantly, sustainability. And in order to achieve that, since the last meeting we have done this, we have decided to establish a foundation, bringing together the public and private sector actors, working collaboratively in order to achieve a collective impact in response to refugee situation in Turkey, and already some Turkish companies have committed to be a part of this foundation. By saying this, I would like to thank once again to all partner institutions for their efforts, <coughs> to our Deputy Minister Kiran for and foremost his support and being here with us, to Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, especially Mr. Mustafa Turan, who has been the heart of the, heart of the project, to YMDB Turkey, to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Zajimash Kavolde, Qatar Fund, World Food Program, and of course the STG Impact Accelerator's professional team. Last but not least, I would like to, you to invite all to explore more on the project and partner with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as I said in the beginning, this was very really inspiring.
to make a difference.
unless you accelerate, and that's why I like the type uh, accelerator, unless you accelerate, but the acceleration doesn't mean just going fast. As the foundation usually say, you have this proverb that we like to use, is that if you want to go, if you want to go fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far and fast, you go together. Um, as a foundation, we know we cannot accomplish it on our own, and it's only through partnership and multiple partnership that these things have to happen. And this is a good example where we can have private sector, UN, government taking the lead in moving things, but also philanthropy and other donors to be able to accomplish it. And this for us is the only way we can sustain some of the changes. We can look at market-based solution because at the end we know the private sector will be there and will continue to be there and finding solutions that actually without even looking only at Turkey, like we hear from Lima, they are not just in Turkey. They will have the capacity to take it around the world. And we know that it's needed in a lot of the different countries and the low, medium low development countries are looking at the example and Turkey has the capacity to actually help a lot of the country in Africa and Asia to actually show the case of being a host of refugees and displacement but also taking the lead of making change and doing things differently. For the foundation, we really believe that this is the only way we can achieve our SDG, and that the SDG have to come to innovation. One of the few things we learn as we look at the innovation is really that it really requires meaningful engagement. As um, Mrs. Ebu mentioned, unless we have meaningful engagement, unless we really mean it, because usually, especially in humanitarian, when we look at private sector, we look at them for their pocket. But I think the private sector has more to offer than the pocket. Of course, we like their pocket, but it's not for them. And I think the private sector have a different way of engaging. They have skill, they have resources, they have a way of doing it, and we desperately need it in the humanitarian sector. We desperately need a different mindset because the, the, the fund we have, the resources are doing are too low compared to the problem we are, we are facing <coughs> and the increasing of the problem. There's no way we'll cope unless we start looking at the different approach. Another way where we really look at is that the private sectors and uh, have expertise. There's quality expertise, they have market, they have their own funding and they can actually take it a simple idea to the scale that we will never be able to do in the normal humanitarian sector. And this is essential if we want to sustain our effort. But more important, um, the mindset and the culture is necessary and we have a lot to learn from the private sector to think about how do we start thinking differently from the onset of a crisis to as the, the crisis is evolving. How do we actually start thinking market solution? How do we start looking at the service delivery differently instead of each organization go and deliver the same thing and we get before? And unless we change that and we learn from the private sector, we will not achieve it. But more important, it's important to have the government be host but also leading and offer facilities. We know the enabling environment is essential, creating policy, creating space for innovation is essential for anything to be happening. And in the last way I want to mention is that scale and sustainability is essential. These problems are not going to go away soon. We know um, how long um, Turkey had refugees from decades and from ever. We know it's not tomorrow we'll get to the end. Then we cannot think short-term solution. We have to continue thinking about how to sustain the effort and how to escape it. Because it doesn't need to benefit only for refugees because if you do that, actually you create tension. But we need to look at it as an integrated, as a global compact and integrated approach for both refugees but as well for the local, the local and the host community. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, this was also very helpful for us to understand different aspects uh, of the problem. Uh, now, the next partner is Welfare Program. Uh, WFP has been very active in Turkey since the beginning of the Syrian crisis and the following humanitarian response. Uh, WFP uh, has been implementing the EU-funded multi-purpose cash transfer scheme called the Emergency Social Safety Net, uh, ESSN, program since September 2016, in partnership with the Turkish Red Crescent. The WFP has also been rolling out blockchain technology as part of its building blocks pilot in Jordan to expand refugees' choices in how they access and spend their cash assistance. The WFP has also joined the SDG Impact Accelerator to experiment new ideas and solutions, in particular digital ID solutions. Therefore, I'm pleased to give the floor to Mr. Brian Lander, Deputy Director of uh, WFP's Geneva Office, to give us more insight into WFP's efforts in innovation for good. Mr. Lander. Thank you very much. Thanks to the organizers of the event to bring the VFP to the table. It's an honor to be here. It's a privilege to represent my colleagues who are working in Turkey and around the world. Uh, WFP very much seized not only this first ever Global Refugee Forum, but also this accelerated budget, very much grounded in the sustainable development goals, as we've already heard. Uh, it, it really demonstrates a practical application of bringing partners together to work towards bringing innovation to, to refugee. Uh, context and as a, as a humanitarian and a development actor, we see it on both sides of, of the, uh, the spectrum in terms of what we're doing for emergency type response, but also then the longer term uh, building up resilience and the ability of refugees to, to manage their own lives. The accelerator, as we've already heard, was initiated by the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Turkey, and we, we commend them for, for taking this, this step to, to bring this. Uh, this together. It's a, it's a country, as we've heard, that's hosting 4 million refugees, 3.6 million of them are Syrians. Uh, it's the largest refugee hosting uh, country in the world at the moment. Uh, and so it's quite extraordinary to, to bring this type of a, a approach to a very complex situation. We really want to express our gratitude to the government for doing that. Uh, we've heard some of the numbers already, but I'll add few more numbers to it. Since 2011, since the beginning of the crisis in Syria, over 660,000 Syrian children have been admitted into Turkish schools. In addition, 27,000 Syrian students are in Turkish universities. Uh, 62 million hospital consultations have been carried out in Turkish hospitals. It's about 650,000 a month. It's, it's extraordinary, really, the, the scale of the, of the situation, the population numbers. Uh, and the infrastructure that's able to adapt and expand to the country. And then you look at that in the broader perspective of over 200 million migrants around the world today and 70 million refugees around the world today. And, and the complex crises that are, are, are driving those numbers. And you look at what's happening in Turkey, it's quite commendable that uh, the government has stepped up and been able to bring these solutions to bear for the population living there. Um, we very much welcome the work that we're doing with, with the government, but also with the Turkish Red Crescent. As, as was already mentioned, we, uh, we were involved in the Emergency Social Safety Net program to deliver assistance to refugees in the country. This was a program that's worth a billion euros, uh, very, very much uh, funded by the European Union. It's a sustainable and nationally integrated program aimed at supporting refugees over the long term. Uh, as of November this year, about 1.8 million people have received assistance through the program. Uh, and in addition, we're providing e vouchers to 60,000 refugees that are hosted in camps. So, again, the scale is just massive. But the efficiency and the systems that have been put in place are, are, are extraordinary when you compare it to what's happening elsewhere. Looking to cash more generally, as it's been mentioned, we've been trying to scale up the way the WFP operates in terms of our cash assistance. Uh, we started out as a food agency, delivering food very much as a, as a commodity. 
And this year we're looking to expand our TAC programs to about 40% of our programs. That's well over a billion dollars. Uh, the reality is that cash is just so much more versatile in empowering the beneficiaries. It allows people to make their own choices and it allows them to optimize the value of the assistance that we give them. And it also entails a much more efficient uh, way of delivering assistance. It brings in uh, less, less heavy supply chain issues, logistical issues, and this sort of thing. So it's, it's very much in that vein that we were involved with the ESSN in, in Turkey and the delivery of cash. And it's, we've learned a lot from the program as well as uh, the partners that are involved. As mentioned, we're, we're working to expand the innovation in this area to, to include blockchain technology. I don't understand blockchain, but it's very interesting. Perhaps with that in place in Jordan, uh, where we're assisting about 106,000 refugees through the means of blockchain to verify the transaction in a neutral way without having to involve uh, different parties. We'll, we'll be looking to expand that out based on our pilot into other services <coughs> such as Bangladesh in the near future. It's just one example of the innovation that we're trying to put in play, building off some of the work that's being done in Turkey and expanding our when it comes to the accelerator itself, we've been very pleased to be part of the process, both as an implementing partner, as a funder of it, and as a technical supporter of, of, uh, of the particular area of digital ID. Uh, seeing that refugees that fled from Syria had left their personal IDs, but also documents related to education or documents related to their health situation. This is very critical in reestablishing when you're trying to start life again somewhere else and eventually return home. So it's, the Accelerator itself has been a huge driver to bring in new ideas with young and dynamic and smart people to, to think about solutions. And so we're very happy that this has been something that we've been able to be part of. Uh, we want to congratulate the teams here that are, are going to present on their projects and uh, see the passion that's coming through in their, in their work. Uh, again, we just really want to value what's happening through this process. It's coming to order together in order to to move beyond talking about what it means to innovate and to be uh, partnering on these issues and to, and to making it very real and linking that to the expertise. So let me finish there and just uh, welcome the, the partners that will be speaking shortly and, and uh, we'll continue working in this day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Orlando. Um, now it's time to move from words to concrete, concrete solutions. It's the Impact Accelerator's first program called for entrepreneurs to address uh, two grand challenges. One, access to livelihood opportunities through digital ID solutions. Second, access to off-grid sanitation systems through reinvented toilets. We have two of the best startup founders among us today to talk about their solutions. The lack of the first one that I am introducing now, uh, Mr. Khalid Maliki, co-founder and COO of Taikan. The lack of uh, a documented identity constitutes for vulnerable and already marginalized people a constant risk of being excluded from services and socio-economic participation. With new technologies such as blockchain, the digital identity solutions have the potential to provide refugees access to basic services and livelihood opportunities. I'm very pleased, therefore, to introduce you to Mr. Maliki, co-founder and CEO of Taikan, a Netherlands-based startup. Taikan's digital identity management <coughs> system allows public and private institutions to share and request personal data in, in a private and secure manner. In May, they received 1.2 million euros investment from a Dutch IT entrepreneur. Taikan joined the SDG Impact Accelerator between July and September this year to adopt their digital IT solutions to serve the refugee populations in Turkey and be replicated in other refugee contexts. Mr. Maliki, please tell us how technology can be further utilized to address the challenges of millions of refugees. The floor is yours. 
thank you, Mr. Mustafa, for giving us the opportunity and the floor, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. My name is Khalid Maliki, and I'm co-founder of Titan, where we validate existence through technology and create access to people's needs because people matter. To achieve this, we are building a blockchain ID management platform to help social economic inclusion of refugees. Before you start speculating what this is about, this is not an ancient transcript or a lost Persian lab. Or if you can read Arabic, it's obvious. But it's actually a verb notification that belongs to my beloved mother. My mother was born in southeast of Morocco in 1950. Back then, they didn't have any registries, so it was registered on paper. In fact, this piece of paper was so fragile that my grandfather had to store it in a bamboo stick and, uh, and preserve it. Well, that, the downside of it is that they couldn't find it for more than 40 years. Uh, when my mother went to make her passport, um, she, they couldn't tell actually how old she was. So, even her. Um, when one, one of my uncles found it a few years later, we came to learn that she, they made her three year, years younger than she actually was. So, I hear some of you thinking, well, this is a birth record from 1950. This doesn't happen today. Well, let's, let's fast forward to today, actually. Staying in the family, this is a birth notification of my beloved daughter in the Netherlands. And yes, it's still on paper. It has similar shape. It's only, it's, it's still yellow. It's well branded. Uh, but it's easy to uh, forge and it's all easy, easy to lose. In fact, Papa needs to go with this piece of paper to the municipality to notify that there is a birth. There is a new member to society. In absence of the baby and the mother. So how can they tell that if I'm actually not registering a, a dog or a cat or a cat? <laughs> the point I want to make here is that identity in general is broken. And it has a problem. It's centralized on a server or a basement somewhere. When on when paper, it's easily destroyed, stolen, or failed. If it's di di digital, it's subject to hacking, breaches, and hacks. Identity is even a bigger problem to 1.2 million billion, uh, billion people around the world who don't have one. Because, because of that, they are unable to access livelihood opportunities such as health, healthcare, education, banking, and finding a job. And the refugees are in the front row of this problem because they do experience this firsthand how it is to lose everything that you are. Your existence and access to life itself. We have learned that the hard way. Titans started amongst refugees and with the refugee story. And when the Syrian civil war reached its climax and Europe began receiving thousands of refugees, we saw how people couldn't verify who they are and what they have achieved in life. Their legal identities, diplomas, land records, all gone. As you know, knowing is good, but understanding is better. So we are very thankful also to the SDG Accelerator that they gave, gave us the opportunity to be on the field, actually, and validate our assumptions while we are uh, working on the solution. Turkey is, of course, a country that hosts 4 million refugees forced to leave Syria. Thanks to the Turkish government, as the GIA, even between all parties involved, we got that access. It, it would be also very crucial in our journey. We knew the problem we were trying to solve, but we needed to understand it, to face and test assumptions that we were making. One of the insights, for example, that we found out is that a refugee may leave everything behind but never his mobile phone. That's often, it's used to communicate with relatives, family, and they have it with them all the time. In fact, more than 90% of Syrian women in Turkey own a mobile phone. And that's, how, that's, a, that's a thing that we use to build our solution. In that tour to Turkey, we found actually three major insights. There are tremendous language barriers between refugees and their host countries. 
These refugees speak Arabic and all information is in Turkish. In Turkish. So having to deal with bureaucracy, government services, and, uh, and to understand actually what there is, it's, it's very difficult for this uh, target audience. <coughs> because of that, refugees had a very hard time accessing bona fide information about what they need and what can access. They're not sure if it's true, and it's only because of her sake. We also found out that uh, they are using uh, the most used application on their phones are is WhatsApp to communicate with relatives and family. Luckily, there are organizations on the field that are doing a great job to solve this problem. However, we couldn't find a scalable solution that is interoperable and working in, uh, in uh, synergy together, giving the refugee uh, possibility to own his data and access services on the go. And we believe that we have found it through Anna. Anna in Arabic means me, so I own my data. Anna is a personal digital agent to, to do ID proofing and access services and livelihood opportunities. So within the app, the entrepreneur or the, the refugee can apply in their own language. Uh, first, they have to, 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 to set up a safe environment uh, to create a personal wallet. And as you can see, the flow and the experience, actually, we took it from the inside. It's, it's used in, 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 in a way that also WhatsApp works. It's like communication between the application and the FDG. This is also because we prioritize human-centered design and being as, as well a like UX expert, user experience expert, we have taken this approach to make it as intuitive as possible for, for the users. Uh, so after setting up the wallet, the entrepreneur can register uh, uh, his, his identity and, for example, register for a company without leaving his place. This can be done by scanning a document that has been acquired or uh, issued by a uh, governmental uh, institute. So the question is, what can you do with it? Well, Anna actually opens a Pandora's box of opportunities. Opportunities for this, these refugees to get access to the services that they want. As a startup, we also understand that it's very easy to be carried uh, away with unrealistic and futuristic solutions. But we understand this sector very, very well. And we have experience in working within it. So we, have provide, we are providing two approaches. One is uh, the ANA platform, which is a plug and play uh, uh, platform that actually can be adopted. But also with existing solutions that are, are there, uh, for example. We are also uh, proudly a partner of the Netlabs Red Cross. We are building on a solution which is called One to One. And it's a faster aid distribution uh, mechanism that can um, provide uh, people in different countries with uh, financial aid. So, for example, we have also heard Mr. Bright that uh, WFP is working on a nice concept for a solution which is called Scope. We also are able to provide a backbone uh, integrated system where, while they're still keeping the, the, the previous one. This makes Anna a Swiss Army knife for ID not only that, the underlying, the underlying technology, which is blockchain, uh, which is used to verify these credential, is called Sovereign, and it's also already proven to work. That's why governments and NGOs are looking into it now, and being also one of the first founding stewards of this uh, network, we are super excited to get the chance to bring this to reality and start helping people that are relying on being also a for-profit company, uh, it's not just a CSR uh, policy with it, uh, to help refugees. It's our core business. With this solution in Turkey, we will be able to lower unemployment, and eliminate bureaucracy, and allow refugees to be employed, for example. So we can bring also higher socio-economic economic inclusion and ultimately low, uh, local economy. So why target? In the past two years, we have become a preferred identity provider of the one-to-one -one consortium, which is backed by the Netlabs Red Cross, amongst other projects. We have already uh, done several projects, 
with the fuel market pipeline starting actually in the first quarter of 2020 will be going live in Malawi in a few months. And we have raised $1.8 million from the farmers to working at Tom and Monster. Of course, we can do that if we didn't have a team of absolute magic makers having experience in the private and in the public sector. I want to close this presentation with a quote that we heard from one of our uh, uh, design sessions on the field. And one of the persons affected actually said, I hope your solution will see the light of day while I'm still alive. And then to change also something not only in the, in the perception of, of me personally, but in the company, we need to come up with a solution as soon as possible. Please join our mission supporting us, and if you have any questions after, afterwards, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Khalid. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, our last speaker uh, is Mr. Mayank Midha, a co-founder and CEO of Garv Toilets. A safely managed sanitation chain is essential to protecting the health of refugee communities and the environment. Uh, leaking latrines and raw wastewater can spread disease and pollute groundwater. 800 children die every day globally because of lack of sanitation, safe sanitation facilities and practices. Our second SDG Impact Accelerator graduate comes from India. GARF Smart Sanitation Center is an integrated tech-enabled solution for all the water, sanitation and hygiene needs of the bottom of the pyramid communities. GARF is also a very successful startup which already received many awards. Mr. Mita, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you for all this about um, the delegates and guests here. Um, my name is Mayan Mita. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the Lord College. All of us gathered here are indeed very privileged that whenever we want to use a toilet facility, we get to use one which is clean and hygienic. But that's not the case with about 2 billion people around this globe who are basically lacking access to basic sanitation facilities. Most of the people living in underserved areas or densely populated areas are dependent on shared sanitation facilities or temporary structures, which are mostly filthy, unhygienic, vandalized. Or also the fact that these facilities are irregularly maintained, which ultimately leads to open defecation practices. So open defecation practices, as has just been explained, also further leads to a lot of diarrhea diseases and a lot of diarrhea deaths. When we got onto the ground, uh, we also got to know in Turkey as well that there are millions of refugees who lack access to proper toilet facilities mostly uh, uh, having access to uh, temporary structures. And many times what happens is it's the women and the children who bear the brunt of uh, this uh, issue, where they have to adjust their schedules and go out in the open or use the temporary structures in the car. And obviously, it's, it's an issue with respect to their dignity and pride as well. We started in India where there is a similar issue with respect to the slum populations as well. So we came up with a solution which is portable, which is prefabricated and made in stainless steel or steel so that it could be prefabricated, it could be taken into densely populated areas and be installed easily. We made it eco-friendly with uh, the use of solar power and also decentralized waste management solutions. When I say decentralized waste management solutions, we couple this toilet with uh, biodigest tanks, which basically uses bacterial uh, media to convert the fetal sludge into treated water, which will further be used as organic fertilizer. Moreover, wherever there are more users of the toilet, we are able to convert the whole fetal sludge into biochar. We made this toilet sturdy, it is vandal proof, it cannot be vandalized. 
plus we made this toilet smart with the use of internet of things and automation with respect to self cleaning and minimizing the human interference with respect to cleaning of toilets and maintenance. These are some of the pictures of the toilets that we have been able to install. Overall today we reach out to more than 140,000 people across the globe through 798 toilet installations which also includes 18,000 plus children in different school wash products. When I talk about smart sanitation, we integrated the toilet solution with IoT infrastructure, which is Internet of Things. This basically solves two purposes for us. One, we are able to track in real time how the toilets are being maintained, if there are any malfunctions inside the toilet, so that our backend teams are able to support and reduce the turnaround time for maintaining the toilet for the place the stairs as in the quad. Plus, we are able to create in real time a user hygiene related data bank where we get to know how many people have used the toilet and how they are using the toilet. In the sense, there's, a, there's an aggregate data collection that's happening which tells you what percentage of the people have washed their hands or what percentage of the people have flushed the toilets to name a few parameters. These parameters helps us in, in basically tracking and working with the communities in the long term to improve the hygiene habits as well. Our business model is pretty simple, where we uh, set up these smart sanitation centers with the help of asset financiers, it could be a CSR, it could be a government body as well, or INGOs. We set up long term partnership contracts and set up these uh, centers on the land provided by the urban local bodies. Plus, there is an NGO partner who supports us on ground with community mobilization activities as well. In terms of traction, over the past four or five years, we have been uh, awarded globally uh, in multiple forums. Uh, we, we have uh, also initiated projects in Bhutan, in Ghana, and Nigeria now as well, where uh, we are being supported by different international NGOs. In India, if we have to just, just uh, get a sense of how big is the market, even now, uh, if we just have to talk about the slum population that exists in India, it's about 23.5 million slum dwellers in just six cities in India who provide us with a total addressable market of about $1.5 billion and an immediate available market of $120 million. And this is just one segment of the market that we are looking at. Apart from the slum populations, we are working in school wash projects, we are working with metro cities, we are working with smart cities, metro rail population. <coughs> so, there's a team that leads to this successful company. Uh, me and my wife are the co-founders and supported by a team which is, has uh, more than 15 plus years of average experience into government sales, into uh, business development with uh, INGOs into rural marketing as well as technology. When I talk about SDGI Agile, it has really helped us with, with focus bootcamp and workshops where we got acquainted with local scenarios and business modeling on how we can focus our business towards the Turkish market of business. Plus, this meant, there, there was mentorship and discussions with industry experts that basically helped us building perspectives and understanding international practices. Last and but not the least, it is the field and the industry visits that were organized under this SDGI program, where we actually got to know the real problems on the ground, on what, what customizations are required in the already existing product infrastructure that we have, so, so as to we can address the basic issues that are being faced by the refugees on the ground. We have suggested a proposal we are, where we are going to set up two sites for, which will serve up to 500 people uh, with portable smart toilets and uh, with proposed partnerships with the uh, Ministry of uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, Gates Foundation and Exasmus. As we all know, if we work towards clean water and sanitation, we are impacting a whole lot of SDGs collectively. In a way, we also impact SDG 3, SDG 11, SDG 5, and 17 as well. I thank you all for listening to me uh, here and listening to our solution. Uh, do support us uh, with uh,
reaching out to us if, if you like the solution and uh, support us to adjust the material as well. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, we have four minutes uh, to leave this room because we have another uh, session starting at exactly three. So, uh, unfortunately, I will only be able to give the floor to one person from the floor, and that's already registered. Uh, is, uh, the Deputy Chairman of the Turkish Republic, Mr. Naji Oromas. The floor is yours. Dear Mr. Chairman, your Excellency, Deputy Minister of Turkey, Yavuz Selim Kramvey, and honorable guests. One of the most important dimensions of the refugee crisis, which deeply affects all humanity, is to ensure that the refugee population has access to livelihoods, economic independence, without the need for assistance and social cohesion with the host community. With this sensitiveness, Turkish Red Crescent community centers, improving the professional capacity and language skills by aiming to increase the employability of people and supporting the labor force policies of our country. Conduct activities to direct employment and to observe rights in working life. At this point, as the Turkish Red Crescent Society, we call on the world to provide refugees with decent working conditions, policies that work on breaking barriers and implementation of joint activities. Thank you so much for your attention, for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have had a great, a great session. Uh, listening to our partners as well as the entrepreneurs. I would like to thank all of them. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please grab us after the session. And uh, please join the platform as it was invited by many of our partners, which have uh, you know, a will to collaborate for this important call. Thank you for coming.